Stevens Pollock, and he is a professor of physics at the University of Colorado at Boulder. His PhD, and well, his BS is from MIT. His PhD is from Stanford, where he studied theoretical nuclear physics. And he did research in theoretical nuclear physics until he received tenure, at which time uh, our education community really benefited, and he started to focus entirely on research in physics and education. So with that, very much. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, the title of my talk um, has many elements to it, and um, the focus really is on the research-based approach. Um, and the, the secondary element is that we're looking at upper division, and the tertiary is physics. So for those of you who are, let me get a, a show of hands. Um, how many are Rice faculty here? Um, how many are K-12 teachers? Anybody? Um, how many are faculty at other institutions? And who didn't raise their hand? <laughs> <laughs> so, good. Um, very, very split. Uh, one more question. Um, how many um, in the natural sciences? And um, uh, mathematics, engineering, um, social sciences? OK, and who, who's left? A couple. OK, so you'll have to tell me afterwards why you're here. Um, this is work being done at um, CU. We have collaborators um, across the country. And uh, just so you know, within our department, we have uh, about 45 physics faculty um, split into a number of groups. There's a particle physics group and a nuclear physics group. And now there's a physics education research group. So we are uh, regular uh, faculty members in the physics department. These graduate students are graduate students who um, are completely typical uh, physics graduate students in every way. They're admitted in the same way to the same program. They take the same comprehensive exams. It's just that the complex, many-body physics problem that they're studying is one that has to do with education rather than nucleons or electrons. Um, and um, this work, I have to gratefully acknowledge the various funding sources, including the National Science Foundation. What I want to do in 25 minutes is, uh, first of all, talk a little bit about the research base. Uh, lots of introduction. It's great to not be the first speaker at this conference. Um, you've heard a lot about the research base, which is primarily, at least in physics, at the undergraduate introductory level. And um, so what I want to talk about is um, first that, and then how do we build on that to think about transformations in our upper division courses. And uh, I think everybody here may be interested in thinking about how you could apply interactive engagement in an upper division or even a graduate level course. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about what's changing and how we implement transformation. And uh, I, I got to show you data, because I'm a physicist. Um, let me start with a plot. So I, I would like to ask, how many have seen Richard Haig's plot? So just a small handful. So let me, let me go through what this is showing you. Um, this is a, a, a paper which was sociologically very influential. Many, many physicists have seen this plot, and um, it has changed their opinions about um, introductory physics and what's going on in there. The horizontal, this is a histogram, and the horizontal axis is basically how much did students learn in an intro physics class. The measure uh, up at the top there is, um, is how it's calculated. So you give a pretest, you give that same test again at the end of the semester as a post-test, and you subtract. So that's how much the students learned. And you divide by how much they could have learned, right? 100 minus pre is uh, how far they could have gone. And so this is basically the fractional gain, the percent of what they didn't already know that you taught them. Uh, or that they learned this semester. And um, this is a paper, it's a meta-study, 6,000 students at a dozen universities and physics departments across the country. And um, you can see that the histogram is not so impressive. So it's fairly narrow, and it's centered around 25%. So the takeaway message here is that traditionally taught courses across the country are teaching students about a quarter of what they didn't already know on this instrument. So now, you know, most physicists say, show me the test, because you're really curious now, is it a good test? Is it an interesting test? It's very elementary. Most faculty look at it and go, I think this is pretty much high school physics. It's all conceptual. There's no calculations on that test. It uses natural language. And um, so it, usually people react with a little bit of surprise. And um, my reaction, like just about everybody's, was, I don't believe it, not my class. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so you know, lots of faculty have tried giving this uh, force concept inventory, and um, it's very reproducible data. 
And this is the other interesting part of that study is that half of those 6,000 students were in interactive environments operationally defined by Richard Hake. So this paper from the American Journal of Physics is well worth looking at if you've never seen it before. You, you see a much larger distribution. So um, you know, th that's already interesting. It says that interactive engagement classrooms are not automatically magical. And the worst of them is doing roughly equivalent to the best of the traditionally taught classes. So this also inspires a lot of people to say, well, maybe I could try figuring out what this interactive engagement thing means um, operationally in my class. Uh, I, I just heard a definition at a recent American Association of Physics Teachers conference. Um, interactive engagement is whatever you do in your class. So. Um, um, at Colorado, we began collecting data in the early 2000s. And um, actually, this is not chronologically the earliest data, which is kind of a, a nice thing. Um, we, we sort of had a regression back to um, somewhat transformed classroom in the lecture. So these are 300 student classes uh, using clickers and interactive engagement in the lecture. But this data set spans four semesters of classes in which the hour a week of recitation with a graduate student and only 30 students was taught very traditionally, problem solving at the board. And um, so we are spanning the left half of what Richard Hake would predict for an interactive engagement classroom. Um, when Colorado uses a learning assistance, which we heard about from Valerie Otero's talk this morning, and University of Washington's research-based tutorials in introductory physics, um, we, we span pretty much, we're replicating um, what what Richard Hake would have predicted. And um, we've begun investigating, well, what's the difference between the classes on the left side of that distribution and the classes on the right side of that distribution? What is different about interactive engagement? And so we can talk about that um, in the breakout session if people are interested. Um, I have one more piece of data that I'd like to show you. Valerie Otero flashed this up very quickly, but I want to sort of walk you through it um, with a little bit more um, time. Um, when we transformed Physics 2, electromagnetism, we made the classic blunder, which was we used all these wonderful new materials, and we had clickers, and we had tutorials, and we hadn't collected any data from our traditional implementation before we made the changes. So although we could compare with national data, my colleagues wanted to know what was the comparison at Colorado with our previous implementation. So I thought, I do have one population, which is our upper division physics majors, who had taken freshman physics two years earlier, I could give them the test. And um, of course, the first time you do it, that's of almost no use, because it's a completely, highly self-selected group of students. It's not at all representative of the large uh, class as a whole. But what you're seeing here is over six semesters worth of data collection, the score on the brief electricity and magnetism assessment. It's a research-based, validated, published uh, conceptual instrument. Remember, this is after upper division e and and the average score here is about 55%, semester after semester. I've compiled uh, three semesters of data into each bin just for um, increasing the statistics, but there's really no difference from class to class or teacher to teacher. So everybody in red has had traditional instruction all the way through, tradition freshenal, freshman physics, traditional upper division physics. Um, in the second bin, we're now starting to see students who have come through from our transformed introductory class. So the blue students had a different freshman experience, but they're in the same room with the same teacher as the red students in that bin. And they don't come with a stamp on their forehead, so the teacher doesn't know who in the room had freshman tutorials and who didn't. But their performance two years down the pike is uh, dramatically different. It's a 20, 15 to 20 point difference. It's, statistically significant, and I would argue it's pedagogically significant. I should also point out that this test is a really hard test. Graduate students are sort of pegging out in the mid-80s or um, maybe 90%, so, um, so this is a pretty good performance. The only group that does better than the people who had had a transformed freshman experience are the people who had taught a transformed freshman experience. These are Valerie Otero's uh, learning assistants who happen to have been physics majors who continued on to take this upper division course. And they're, they're doing the best of all. So I showed this data to my colleagues. Um, you know, we have regular brown bag uh, lunches where we get together and talk about various educational topics. And um, people kind of nodded their heads because there was always this undercurrent of worry that all these research-based transformations at the freshman level were good for the average student 
or the unwashed masses. But, but what about our physics majors, those gems in the room? You know, this is a 600 student class of whom 30 are physics majors. And there was always this worry that maybe we were boring them or wasting their time by all this touchy-feely get into a group and talk about the conceptual <laughs> physics stuff. So, you know, it was nice to see that the physics majors were in fact benefiting and they were benefiting two years later. Still, my colleagues, ever the skeptics, said, yeah, but maybe what this means is that although they're doing well as juniors on a freshman level exam, how are they doing in that class? You know, can they do Fourier, Legendre, Bessel function, you know? So, oops. so um, the answer is, uh, we just looked at their grades in these classes. Uh, it's a B-centered class, so three out of four is where the historical average had been. And within, remember, blue, uh, red, and yellow on the right there are in the same class with the same instructor. The, the students who had been through the freshman reformed pedagogy are doing not statistically significantly uh, better, but definitely not worse, actually getting slightly higher grades in the upper division course. This went a long way to calm nerves and, um, and to not only interest faculty in teaching introductory physics in this way, but to start to ask if this can benefit our physics majors in this way, could it in fact benefit them if we continue with these practices in the upper division as well? And um, so that's really now the, the question that we've been investigating for the last couple of years. Um, why would you think about transforming upper division physics? So already, you know, we've seen some clues and hints. We know a lot about how people learn. Uh, a lot of education research is based on mechanism and, um, and there's social elements and there's cognitive elements. And this has all been incorporated very well in these large intro physics classes. And so we pose this as a research question. Could our physics majors learn better from interactive techniques adapted from introductory physics. It has to be adapted. Obviously, the materials are no longer relevant for upper division physics majors. And again, in the breakout session, we'll talk a little bit more about w what that might look like um, in, in the classroom. Um, I want to sort of get into specifics there, um, but not with a focus on physics content. So for those of you who are wondering if you should come to a talk that's labeled transforming upper division physics, it's really about transforming upper division and uh, we won't be talking so much about the physics content because um, that's not of as broad interest. I want to show you one more little chart, um, which is just a it's, this, it's, it's a bunch of stars filling in the blanks. So running down the column here is uh, many of our upper division physics courses. So those of you who are physicists uh, recognize the titles of these courses. Otherwise, it's just the junior and senior level physics classes, and at the bottom row, a graduate atomic and molecular course. And um, it's a timeline. So in spring of 2004, if you can see that blue star, one physics education research faculty member decided he would introduce uh, clickers and peer instruction into a 25 student upper division class. He worked very hard developing these questions. It was not research based. It was just a, you know, a conscientious faculty member making up good questions. And um, it was very popular. Students liked it. And uh, then those questions went off to a shelf. Two semesters later, I was at a party about a week before the semester began, and I mentioned to a colleague who was assigned to teach StatMech that these questions existed, and he said, oh, I really like clicker questions. I've used them when I teach freshman physics. So now you need to know about Colorado. We cycle faculty through courses, so nobody gets to own a course. You teach a course once, you get pretty high priority if you ask to teach it a second time, and you get the absolute lowest priority if you ask to teach it a third time. So basically, faculty are teaching all the undergraduate courses and graduate courses, and uh, people cycle in and out of the intro level class. So we're all getting exposed to the, these pedagogical approaches just because of the luck of the draw. So um, this faculty member um, had a good time, and he thought it was worthwhile. And then again, they sort of sat on the shelves. And then more faculty were getting exposed to what was going on in the freshman level courses and began trying it out in their upper division courses. So. Um, the professor in the top row had just heard the buzz. She had actually never taught one of these intro classes. So she teamed up with Professor Blue um, in the PER group and said, can you help me write questions? Because I don't really know how to write good clicker questions. What would that mean at the junior level? I kind of know how to write a conceptual quickie question for freshmen, but that's a little bit more problematic at the upper division. All the rest were just faculty members who liked the feeling of pausing class, having students talk to each other, having hearing student voices, seeing how the students were doing. And uh, the graduate EMO, AMO uh, class was taught, team taught by two faculty. Um, all of these, I'll show you some data, were very popular with the students. And now, you know, CU has just gone wild with these things. Um, 
In fact, you can see the PER group was, we were a little slow on the uptake. You know, somewhere um, around uh, 2008, I looked around and realized this is going on. It's going on without any research, and we should really get an NSF grant to study the process and try to be a little bit more systematic about the materials that we're using, the activities that we engage in. And in particular, we're operating here without a real understanding, except for our experience as teachers, of where the students are coming from. You, you know, it's so critical in all transformed pedagogy to understand the students that you are, who you're teaching um, as well as you can so that you know where they're coming from. You know, we decide where we want to take them, but you can't decide where they're coming from. That's just what it is. So uh, the, the two um, lines, the electromagnetism and the quantum mechanics courses are the ones that we focused on. And um, so what changed? Um, you know, these two pictures kind of represent symbolically what changed. In the old days, the camera person takes a picture of the teacher and the blackboard. That's the focus of attention. And now, the, the focus of attention has turned backwards to the students. The, the photographer wants to take a picture and observe what the students are doing rather than what the teacher is doing. And I think that's very emblematic of what changed. Um, the first thing that we did, uh, so we already heard about this earlier today, have a, um, um, a committee. Um, and uh, it, really, the idea was the following. The physics education research is a definite sort of community. It's an academic community within physics. and um, there's journals and there's conference proceedings and it's established that this can be a research activity within physics departments. Nevertheless, many faculty have this sort of feeling that there's a product being pitched and nobody likes that feeling, including the researchers who are trying to develop good materials nor the, the faculty who feel that they're being sold something to. So um, we decided right from the get-go this was gonna be a collaborative effort. It was gonna be grassroots. What do upper division professoriate want out of transformed classes. And whatever that is, that's what we're going to try to achieve. So we had many, many brown bag lunches talking about learning goals. And in the breakout session, I'll show you what we came up with, but I think we'll also have a conversation about what would be your learning goals for an upper division course in your department. And um, one of the things that um, happened very quickly was we stopped talking about content. We already agreed on what junior level electromagnetism content is. We've been teaching out of the same book for 150 years. And uh, so we didn't really debate that. We could have, but we chose instead to talk about sort of higher level learning goals. What would we, you know, we all want our students to be more intellectually mature. But what would that mean operationally and how could we observe that and then how could we facilitate that growth? So we developed at, at this point some interactive classroom techniques much of the stuff that you've been hearing about and you're all familiar with, um, although perhaps at the introductory level, we tried thinking about how we could do that at the upper division. The concept tests, these are clicker questions. This is, it turns out, the easiest thing for Colorado faculty to adopt. Um, everybody takes them and says, oh, I gotta change that question. In fact, they gotta change all the questions, but that's just fine. It becomes their question then. Um, but that base, having that base of questions, that bank of questions, proved to be extremely beneficial and comforting and save people a lot of time. We thought a lot about the homework. In physics classes, um, it's the culture that by the time you get to the junior level, homework is a big chunk of where the learning in the class happens. At least that's the hypothesis. You know, students are handing in 10 to 20 page assignments every week. And the faculty would completely reject any transformation that uh, got rid of or in some way softened those homework assignments. So we had to work within that constraint and so in fact we made them longer and harder by asking conceptual questions at the start, middle and end. Sketch this field, is it physically realizable? Give me a physics, ex give me a real life example where this mathematical formalism that you just worked out would apply. And um, so those were the changes that we made in the homework. Outside of class, we followed the model from freshman physics of guided help sessions and uh, tutorials. Tutorials we really based on the University of Washington's model. University of Washington crafts conceptual activities which are connected with the sort of the content and formalism that's being taught in the class. So they go side by side. In our case, somebody asked this question earlier today, they were optional. We couldn't figure out a way to make these tutorials mandatory we are now thinking about a model in which, like the astronomers at Colorado, we might give up a lecture every week or two in order to run a tutorial. But for the moment, these have been optional. 
they were Friday afternoons, about half the class showed up every week. Um, and this has been going on for seven semesters now. So these things are quite popular with the students, even though we don't feel comfortable directly addressing tutorial questions on exams out of fairness to the students who just by their scheduling cannot make it to these things. So let me show you a little bit of data. Um, we're comparing traditionally taught classes and transformed classes. Some of these at Colorado, it's not hard to find traditionally taught upper division courses to collect data in. Um, we've got uh, statistics for almost 500 students now. This is one of the issues with upper division research. You know, in the freshman level class, you get that in one semester. Um, here it took us five semesters to build up this data set. Um, we recognize that many faculty are interested in the kinds of questions they've always been asking. So we've used some traditional exam questions as assessment tools. These are not research-based. They haven't been validated by anybody except the faculty members who buy into them, um, which is very important. But we thought it was also important to develop with our colleagues a conceptual upper division instrument. So we don't want to keep giving that freshman level class to juniors because they're learning new stuff. But we didn't want to give a quantitative problem-solving algebraic kind of test because we're already doing that. So we put two years worth of effort into developing this Colorado Upper Division Electrostatics Assessment. And again, this was done in brown bag um, lunches with regular faculty so that in the end, first of all, their reaction should be like the freshman force concept inventory. That's pretty elementary for juniors, but I'm sure my students know that. that that's the reaction that we really wanted to get out of all those questions. So here's the scores. And, um, We've broken the data down into classes that were um, transformed on the left in blue and classes that were taught in the traditional lecture style on the right. And the data set looks a lot like Richard Hake's freshman data set. So we're, we're it replicating in a sense that the transform pedagogy impacts students' ability to perform on this kind of instrument. Um, as before, the worst of the, of the research-based classes is doing, in fact, better than any of the traditional courses. And there's lots of variation within uh, and across uh, different institutions and different faculty. Um, another thing you might notice is uh, that the top score here is 75% uh, <laughs> on this instrument. So that's also, you know, we, we certainly have no pretense that we've solved any problem. Um, we're, we're taking steps towards understanding how and what students are learning at the upper division level, and uh, we clearly have a long way to go. The, the really big surprise, I think, for most faculty is that uh, in a traditionally taught class, their students were scoring in the mid-40s on a test that the faculty had written and assumed that these were easier questions than their traditional exam questions because there was no calculations to be done. On those traditional exam questions, again, red is in the traditionally taught course and um, blue is in the uh, research-based uh, course. Now, this was the first semester, and I was teaching it. I, th there's an effect at Colorado. We call it the Steve effect. Um, who knows what it is? Students get fired up in my class. Um, this is maybe more representative data um, from somebody who's never taught an upper division course at all. So, so the red faculty member was very experienced, and the, the blue faculty member was first time ever teaching a, a junior level electromagnetism course. And the outcome here is exactly what we have seen at the freshman level which I would characterize is no damage done. Okay, so we're not harming, nor are we really significantly improving their ability to perform on the traditional measures. We've just added another dimension to the course. And we believe from our observations and our videos and our interviews that there are many, many more dimensions which are being positively impacted. Attitudes and beliefs, behavior patterns, study patterns, which we're not measuring at all with any of these instruments. And um, it's something we're thinking a lot about is if you can measure it, to a physicist, that's when it becomes real. Um, we asked our students how useful for your learning is the addition of clicker questions. So you can take this with whatever grains of salt you like. We value our students' opinions, and in particular, at the upper division level, no faculty member is likely to adopt research-based or transformed pedagogical approaches if the students are going to then slam them on the, on the faculty evaluations at the end. This is a, a study, this is kind of important. It's 264 students across 12 classes. It's that whole star chart. So some of this is research-based, but most of this is just faculty making up clicker questions on the fly based on you know, their intuitions and their experience teaching. And um, I, I think this is a Colorado phenomenon. Our students are drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, 
So 80% of the students are claiming that lectures with clickers are more useful or much more useful, and it's sub 5% who are saying that peer lecture is more useful to their learning. If you come to the afternoon session, I'll show you some data where we asked these questions of students in the upper division who had not yet used or seen clickers in the upper division, and it's, it's inverted. So until they had experienced it, they did not believe in it, and so you too might have to be cautious about polling your students. Would you like us to try this? I, I wouldn't suggest doing that. So um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Steve Pestis. It's a relatively new comic strip. Um, he, he has a, a strip which emphasizes this idea that pedagogy and at, at all levels is about two-way conversation. And you know, this is not a two-way conversation, um, not the way I'm running this PowerPoint presentation. Um, so here's Professor Ratt speaking to, I presume, front row student pig in a classroom. If you could have a conversation with one person, living or dead, who would it be? And in a traditional class, you would pause for all students to reflect, and then you would tell them what the correct answer is. Um, but this is a constructivist professor who listens to their students. Um. <laughs> when you ask the students, you sometimes hear things that surprise you and open your eyes to what's happening in the classroom, ways that are very productive. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of what's happening without going into the details. So if you want to hear the details, I've got many materials for you um, to, to um, help you think about how this might look and feel in your own class. The bottom line is that we, starting with non-education research faculty and then followed by education research faculty, are transforming the way our upper division classes look. It's not a radical transformation. I think if you sat in on one of our classes, you would not feel that um, anything traumatic uh, or, or um, distressing was going on. Um, in fact, most faculty are doing this because it feels right to them. Um, listening to students conversing for five minutes out of a 50-minute lecture is extremely, um, it's very stimulating as a, as a teacher. Um, we're having measurable impact on content learning. And uh, I didn't show you this data, but we're also having an impact on participation. Um, students are coming to class in our upper division classes more uh, now that we have interactive engagement, classroom activities, kinesthetic activities, clicker questions, tutorials. Um, uh, we thought a lot about um, how is it that when you transform a class, this will get used by other faculty. It's a nice academic intellectual activity as arcane as the rest of my physics colleagues' research if, you know, if you're just trying to understand how students learn some particular topic without the goal of applying it. But um, we decided right away that we also wanted this to be something that other faculty, both at Colorado and at other institutions, could take advantage of. All these materials are free and online, and um, they're modularized. So if you decided you were teaching an upper division e &M course, and you thought, I would like to just try a clicker question for one day. I don't have clickers, but we'll raise hands or do something. Uh, that would be relatively easy to do. You could um, identify topics both by activity and also by content. Um, I have a question on, on buy-in. So at Colorado, uh, for six semesters, this upper division e &M course was taught by a sequence of quasi-randomly chosen faculty um, who adopted these techniques. And then a faculty member came in who had taught it before and said, no thanks, I've got my old lecture notes, I'm very comfortable with them, my class is just fine. And um, this is Colorado, you can do whatever you want. I, I, I suspect it's the same everywhere. You can do whatever you want in your upper division courses and um, very few people will pay uh, much attention at all. Um, so uh, we're seeing a mix and um, some faculty are very excited about it and some faculty are very skeptical. Um, but but what's been really uh, exciting for us is the, the level of interest. There's a lot of faculty who come to these brown bag lunches. And we never anticipated this at the start. We really thought there was going to be maybe three or four faculty who would want to come. And instead, something like 30 out of 45 faculty have participated at some level in these informal and time-consuming conversations. Um, we're developing lots of materials. We've got resources. And um, very important to us is we're trying to develop assessment instruments so that it's not just how did it feel or did the students like it, but what are the students learning and is it matching our learning goals? And um, I always like to end my talk by pointing out that education research is really not about teaching. Um, that's a nice benefit, but, uh, but education research is about the students and about student learning. 
And, um, and it's, a, it's a change in focus. And if you're thinking about education research as how should I be teaching, it becomes, um, uh, I think, less appealing and um, doesn't seem maybe so relevant. Um, but when you start getting curious about what's happening in the room and how are students uh, responding, all of a sudden I think it becomes very, um, very stimulating and very productive. So I will stop here. Um, the, the video uh, uh, collection at stemclickers.colorado.edu will be of interest to all faculty at all levels. Um, it's little short videos and interviews of faculty so you can see what does a clicker activity look like in a real classroom rather than you know, in some abstract sense. The uh, per.colorado.edu is our uh, research, physics education research website. So if you want to learn more about what we're doing or grab materials, that would be the place to go. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Steve? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm sorry. What is, a, what is a tutorial? A tutorial is a, um, an activity crafted so that a small group of students will sit at a table and um, it's largely conceptual rather than calculational. And, um, and the instructor's role is not to teach the material but to ask Socratic questions and listen to the students as they struggle with this conceptual problem. And why is that an after class activity? So um, we did that because most of my colleagues were loath to give up even a single lecture. You know, we're, we're so programmed with what content we have to cover in the class that giving up 50 minutes for this activity was not seen as a viable option. So we put it into this optional out of class activity. The idea originally was we'll develop these things, we'll demonstrate that they work, and then faculty will take them and bring them into the classroom. And um, that has happened from time to time. But um, by and large, we are still deeply entrenched in our traditions. And uh, I have a certain number of chapters I'm supposed to cover. And if I don't, I get worried that my colleagues will think I'm watering down the curriculum. Uh, do we have time for another question or not? Uh, short, short question. Why do faculty all teach all courses? Why it's a, you know every institution has its own traditions. Uh, I think in physics it's partly an ego thing um, that you can, <laughs> and it's partly um, because it's uh, stimulating to teach new things and learn new things for faculty. It keeps you from getting into ruts and getting tired of that same old class. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure because it's not true at all institutions and it's not true in all departments. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. This program is protected by a copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice Digital Media Services.